Good morning. Uh, thanks to Rob for the kind invitation to speak this morning. Uh, my name is Matt Wiles. I'm a consultant and ETHIS based in Sheffield, mainly doing neuroanesthesia uh, and intensive care. I've just got a couple of declarations of interest. First, I'm a, uh, a member of the editorial board of anesthesia, as Rob said, and I was part of the association of an ETHIS working party that produced the guidelines on TV use. I was also trained by everyone in Nottingham, so if I say anything crazy, then it's probably not my fault. Um, I'm duty bound by my, by my editor in chief to add a plug for the journal, and in this case, for the supplement that we've just published in early January relating to all things relevant to the brain. My clinical director also makes me add a plug for working in Sheffield. We do have jobs available, and just as a little taster, this picture was taken last week during my commute home from work. I can recommend heartily the benefits of working in a tertiary teaching hospital that's situated on the edge of a national park. Now, I'm not going to try to overwhelm you all with data and graphs and fancy slides and references, as I'm sure that uh, none of you are let to uh, yet to normalise your uh, routine working plasma caffeine levels. So instead, I've prepared a summary document that you can freely download either from my blog, if you just Google uh, STH Journal Club, as in Sheffield Teaching Hospitals, it's the first hit. Um, I've also tweeted a link from my Twitter account of the same name, and there's a QR code uh, for, that will take you straight to the blog as well. Uh, the summary has embedded links to all the papers I'm going to discuss today, including full text links where these are available. So uh, Sheffield was an early adopter for TIVA, particularly for neurosurgery, and it's the primary technique for all the neuroanesthetists. However, TIVA has seen a big upsurge in its use over the past 10 years. The data from the NAP5 study in 2014 suggested that only 8% of anesthetics in the UK were TIVA based, whilst the more recently published iHype study that collected data in 2016 on patients aged over 65 years having general anaesthesia show that almost 20% now receive TIVA anaesthetic. As such, anaesthetists are clearly finding that TIVA offers them a number of advantages in their clinical practice, and that anaesthesia has moved on significantly from many years ago when malignant hyperpyrexia was the sole indication for a TIVA anaesthetic. There are a variety of reasons underlying this upsurge in usage, although it should be noted that there are a lack of data supporting significant clinical improvements in patient outcomes associated with TV use. That's one of the reasons why we have ongoing studies at the moment comparing this, because the question is still uncertain. Now, like many pharmacological interventions, TIVA is not a magic bullet. And indeed, this is true for nearly every intervention in medical practice. And the primary reason underlying this phenomenon is the difficulty in controlling for confounding effects. To return to my own specialty of neuroanesthesia, this illustrates the point well. Over the past 20 years, there have been over 100 randomized control trials looking at single drug interventions for the management of traumatic brain injury. And to date, not a single one has shown a meaningful outcome, either in survival or neurological outcome. And this slide illustrates one of the potential reasons. All of these images show a traumatic brain injury. However, an extradural hematoma, subdural hematoma, contusional injury, diffuse axonal injury, cerebral edema, and traumatic subarachnoid hemorrhage all produce very different cerebral effects and indeed may all coexist with one another at the same time. And yet all are considered and researched as traumatic brain injury, which is a very broad church indeed. And this occurs before we take into account the individual patient characteristics, including the presence of comorbid conditions, age of the patient and presence of other injuries. Given this, it's unsurprising that a single intervention such as anaesthetic technique fails to produce meaningful outcome effects. Indeed, this difficulty is likely to be magnified when we consider isolated theatre anaesthetic practice. In this setting, the patient exposure to our therapy of interest will be at most a few hours, even with the slowest of surgeons. Given all the other variables that are encountered during the perioptive pathway, starting from GP management of comorbid disease, prehabilitation, preoperative assessment, enhanced recovery programmes after surgery, rehabilitation physiotherapy, and adjuvant therapy post-surgery, the lack of evidence supporting anaesthetic technique impact on an outcome is unsurprising. However, 
Across the published literature, there are hundreds of papers proposing benefits for TIVA based upon physiological hypotheses, majority of which are in animal studies. Now, many of these are shown in this summary, summary slide, and over the next 25 minutes, I will try to run through the majority of these with a particular focus on what I think are the two major drivers behind the increased interest in intravenous anesthesia, which are the potential oncological and environmental benefits. I'll start with a relatively niche, but I think important area of neuroanesthetic and orthopedic spinal practice. Transcranial evoked potentials are increasingly being used in both intracranial and spinal surgery in order to try and detect and attenuate spinal cord damage. This monitoring can be done either using sensory or motor responses, and there is no doubt that volatile anesthetics significantly reduce the amplitude of motor evoked potentials, and as a result, have a higher rate of false positives during monitoring. Although the clinical value of evoked potentials in preventing spinal cord injury may be questioned, medically legally this carries a lot of significance, and I can personally think of no compelling reason not to use a technique that may reduce the incidence of spinal cord injury, given the lifelong effect this may have. As such, I think outside of malignant hyperpyrexia, this is the only absolute indication for total intravenous anesthesia. Moving on to some of the other hypothesized benefits of TIVA on other organ systems, the next most common indication for TIVA is probably neurosurgery. Most of the physiological and pharmacological basis for encouraging TV use in this area is based upon profiles ability to reduce cerebral metabolic rate and therefore cerebral blood flow and intracranial pressure. And indeed it does this very effectively. However, volatile anesthetics have a very similar effect in terms of reduction of cerebral metabolic rate, whilst also preserving cerebral autoregulation. Sevaflurane at up to end tidal conversations of 1.5 mac and desflurane up to 1 mac are likely to be as good in terms of cerebral hemodynamics. It's also worth noting that the majority of studies that investigated volatile anesthesia did not adjust the mac for age and nor was remifrentanil in routine use at the time those studies were completed. As such, the majority of patients in these studies probably received a relative overdose of volatile anesthetic agents that would not be seen in usual clinical practice. It would appear that the standard neuroanesthetic approach in centres that use volatile of an age-adjusted end-tidal MAC of 0.7 in conjunction with remifentanil will have minimal effects on cerebral hemodynamics and will be equivalent to a TIVA-based anesthetic. This was borne out by a meta-analysis of volatile versus propofol use for maintenance in neurosurgery, which suggested that propofol-based anesthesia only reduced the intracranial pressure by less than five millimeters of mercury. But this also included studies where nitrous oxide was used in conjunction with volatile anesthesia, meaning the actual effect on intracranial pressure is likely to be far smaller. In terms of other organ systems, historically it was felt that volatile anesthesia offered protection against myocardial injury by ischemic preconditioning. However, it appears that it's the presence of preoperative unstable or indeed myocardial infarction itself that actually causes the preconditioning, as was borne out by the analysis of the Scandinavian data registry. It was then theorized that the antioxidant effect of propofol may be a benefit, particularly in conjunction with cardiopulmonary bypass use. However, a trial published in 2019 compared inhalational and intravenous anesthesia for patients undergoing single vessel coronary artery bypass grafting, and this showed no difference in one year mortality. Similarly, if we think about the renal system in terms of effects on the kidneys, several animal studies have produced biologically plausible benefits of propofol based anesthesia. However, this has not been ex studied extensively in humans as yet, and clinical studies on this outcome remain very limited indeed. Given our ageing population, there is an increased interest in the impact of anaesthetic technique on older patients, given that these patients are more susceptible to the adverse effects of both surgery and anaesthesia due to reduction in physiological resilience and a greater incidence of comorbid medical conditions. Previously, there have been concerns about the use of TIVA in older patients due to worries regarding an increased incidence of hypotension and because the majority of pharmacokinetic models used when TCI is delivered were developed in young, healthy patients and may not be directly applicable to this population. However, there's no evidence to suggest that TV is harmful for older patients and indeed may offer some advantages. 
a Cochrane review showed that inhalational and propofol based anesthesia had similar effects in terms of 30 day mortality and duration of stay in patients aged over 60 years who underwent non cardiac surgery. There was, however, low certainty evidence that maintenance of propofol reduced the incidence of perioperative neurocognitive disorders. However, what wasn't clear was whether this was due to the TIVA technique itself or potentially the increased use of processed EEG monitoring that often accompanies this. As this has recently been shown in a study to decrease the incidence of post-optic neurocognitive dysfunction in older patients. Further work is needed in this area to compare volatile anesthesia and TIVA-based anesthesia when processed EEG use is in place. In terms of post-operative analgesia, there are reasons to suggest that propofol may offer benefits in this regard due to its effects on GABA and NMDA receptors, both of which play important roles in the central sensitization of pain. A meta-analysis of randomized controlled trials has shown that propofol is associated with reduced pain scores 24 hours after surgery. However, although the differences in pain in these studies reached statistical significance, the absolute differences were very small being less than 10 millimetres on a numerical relating scale, suggesting that these benefits are not clinically relevant. Of greater interest, perhaps, propofol may reduce the incidence of chronic post-surgical pain. Propofol inhibits the hyperexcitability and upregulation of currents in sensory neurons and has been shown to reduce the, the incidence of chronic pain after hysterectomy and thoracotomy. However, once again, further work is needed to determine the precise role of TIVA in this regard, as the development of chronic pain is multifactorial. Another commonly cited benefit of profile based anesthesia is the perceived reduction in patient awakening time, which is of particular relevance in neurosurgery, where a day case procedure is one that takes all day. However, a Cochrane review found that time to eye opening and tracheal extubation is only around 30 to 90 seconds more rapid with profile based anesthesia compared with a carefully titrated volatile technique, which is clearly not significant either from a patient or a financial perspective. This very small time saving will not allow an extra case to be done on an operating list and certainly makes little difference to the day I had uh, illustrated in the chart below. Of note, this review also found that recovery criteria were also identical between the two techniques, including patient orientating PACU and Audrey's score. In terms of effect on post-optive nausea and vomiting, there is no doubt propofol is an effective antiemetic. However, delivery of propofol-based anesthesia is only actually equivalent to adding in one additional antiemetic agent. That is to say, propofol anesthesia given with ondansetron is equivalent in terms of risk of POMV to volatile anesthesia plus ondansetron and dexamethasone. You can think of giving a TIVA anesthetic for POMV as adding in perhaps a third or fourth antiemetic agent. As such, as alternative exists, once again, there is no overwhelming case to be made for the benefits of TIVA in this regard. So then most of the clinical uh, areas I wanted to go through. So for the, the last half of this talk, I'll move on to the two most common areas which I think have been behind the upsurge in the interest in TIVA, namely its potential health benefits in terms of oncological surgery and the effects it may have upon the environment. In terms of oncological surgery, this interest was first provoked by Tim Wigmore's work from the Marsden in a retrospective single centre review. Around 80% of patients will require surgical intervention during treatment for cancer, and the impact of surgery and anaesthesia on the immune system is of great interest. Propofol tends to preserve immune function and does not suppress cytotoxic activity of natural killer cells, and is also directly involved in the regulation of various signaling pathways that serve to decrease cancer development. As such, there have now been a number of retrospective studies in this regard that appear to support the hypothesis that TIVA offers significant cancer survival benefits. However, there's been a failure to control for a number of confounding factors in most of these studies, as is indeed common in retrospective studies, such as time bias, tumor stage and status, use of adjuvant analgesic techniques, use of corticosteroids, and the role of adjunct therapy by oncologists. Indeed, some of my oncology colleagues are somewhat disappointed that anesthetists appear to be of the view that what we can offer in our two hour window is somehow more key to patient outcome than what they offer in terms of ongoing chemotherapy and adjuvant regimes. 
These were refined and updated every few months in well-conducted randomised controlled trials in order to improve patient outcomes. Whilst we await the results of numerous ongoing prospective clinical trials in regard to cancer surgery, at present there is no clear evidence that a propofol-based anaesthetic is superior to a good volatile anaesthetic. Indeed, it may be that the key role for anaesthetic technique in oncological surgery is ensuring the ability of the patient to return to the intended oncological therapy pathway as soon as possible by minimising length of stay and avoiding the instance of any complications. And it may turn out that this is the area in which TIVA offers a clinical advantage for oncology rather than at a cellular level. And finally, I'm just going to discuss the environmental effects of anaesthetic technique. Now, locally within Sheffield, this has been a major driver for people transiting from a volatile technique. And yet this is the area in which I think we are desperately short of high quality data to determine whether this is the correct thing to do. Now, I'm not an expert in this area, so I did what I always do when I'm not sure, and that speak to a colleague who is an expert, in this case, Cliff Sheldon. And I asked him whether he thought, as an expert in the area, if TIVA was a green anaesthetic option. He said it's impossible to say. He just doesn't know because he thinks the true ecological effects of anaesthesia are largely unknown. And much like the old analogy of the visible compared to the hidden part of the iceberg, the environmental and climate effects of anaesthetic techniques are largely unclear or unknown at present. As is shown by this slide, all commonly used inhalational anaesthetic agents are greenhouse gases. And the overall contribution of these agents to global warming depends not only on the energy that they absorb, but also on their atmospheric lifespan. Global warming potentials combine these two factors and compare the atmospheric release equivalent to a mass of CO2 over a specified time period. For example, in this slide, they considered a 20 year time period. It is these data that have formed the basis of nationwide green initiatives to try and replace desflurane and nitrous oxide with alternative, alternative agents. And I would certainly have no problems with this going forward. As I feel within anaesthetic practice, there are equivalent options that allow identical clinical outcomes. As total intravenous anaesthesia clearly involves the exclusive use of intravenous agents, this completely avoids the direct admissions of greenhouse gases. But note that's the, the direct admissions. A 2012 study found a carbon footprint of profile based anaesthesia to be substantially lower than any inhalational anaesthetic, despite the greater use of disposables such as syringes. Because the carbon footprint of inhalational anaesthetic agents is more than 95% due to their release as waste anaesthetic gases, it's very unlikely that any intravenous agent will have a worse carbon footprint unless its manufacturing process is very energy intensive. Thus, from a climate point of view, there is clearly a potential benefit for a TIVA based anaesthetic. However, we need to expand our view beyond pure climate issues and also look at the wider ecological issues associated with TIVA. Many of the studies that have produced models for calculating the ecological impact of anaesthesia have un uh, often have unmeasured effects, including the increased generation of landfill, production of microplastics and noxious pollutants, particularly dioxins associated with disposal of equipment, especially syringes, the increased requirement for pack packaging of single use items and the inability for us to recycle things such as the glass files that contain propofol. In addition, there can be direct ecological con contamination by medications such as propofol, either because of direct wastage into hospital water systems or following excretion of the drug or its metabolites by the patient. For example, Although less than 1% of propofol is excreted by the patient unchanged in the urine, it has been found in measurable quantities in drinking water and in aquatic animals. Treatment of hospital wastewater and sewage treatment works are not designed to remove drugs from the effluent, and indeed some propofol metabolites can be degluconidated in water treatment facilities, thereby increasing the concentration of free propofol. We also need to have a clear idea of the implications involved in the production and disposal of intravenous anaesthetic agents. For example, soybeans, which are necessary to provide Californians with tofu, but they also provide our soybean oil for propofol, is associated with significant deforestation within South America. The carbon footprint associated with the manufacture of propofol also remains very unclear and is very much nation dependent, as some nations predominantly use coal powered electricity during the process with clear ecological implications. 
In addition, it's vital that we don't lose sight of our core business of providing the best outcomes for our patients. From an ecological perspective, the worst possible outcome from a surgical episode is the occurrence of complications with the potential for reoperation and an increased duration of hospital stay. Although volatile anaesthetics do make up a significant part of the NHS ecological footprint, this is dwarfed by that which we see produced during routine delivery of care. I think the principles of environmentally sustainable anaesthesia that we recently published in anaesthesia are excellent. And in particular, it's of note that there was no specific recommendations regarding the use of total anaesthesia over volatile anaesthesia. Instead, there was a focus of, on minimising overuse and waste and the need for collaboration within the industry to improve environmental sustainability and most importantly, to ensure that future purchasing decisions are made on ecological principles. There is now an increased interest in volatile capture devices that may also reduce atmospheric release of inhalation agents and could potentially form an elegant solution to a problem. However, there are many questions regarding this device, namely what happens to captured volatile within the canisters. As at present within the UK, this vapour is not able to be recycled for use in a different patient. And clearly vapour that is exhaled after tracheal extubation will continue to be an environmental contaminant within the hospital itself. I would urge you to read an excellent paper by Hugh and colleagues which modelled the effect of vapour catch technology and suggested that this may make the use of Siva fluorine as climate friendly as Tiva. It also makes some excellent question marks regarding some of the modelling that has been done previously with Siva fluorine. The paper was unfortunately published in a very niche recycling journal and, and thus far has been largely overlooked by the anaesthetic community. Similarly, propofol anaesthesia is not without waste, and if done clumsily, can easily have a worse or equivalent ecological footprint in terms of waste. I would urge all teas enthusiasts to use the free app Propofol Dreams. This allows you to calculate the anticipated amounts of propofol that you need to avoid wastage in syringes. If at the end of an anaesthetic, there's still 45 mils of propofol remains in, in a new sterile syringe, it's unlikely that you've made significant ecological gains compared to low flow volatile anaesthesia. We await with interest the development of Remy Mazalam, which as it is almost 100% metabolized by tissue esterases in a similar manner to Remy fentanyl, will have a very low ecological footprint and very low potential for environmental pollution. This may offer us significant advantages either as a volatile or profile sparing agent in the future. So in summary, what would I urge you to do with regards to TIVA? At present, outside of the patient with malignant hyperpyrexia or one who requires spinal cord monitoring, there is no clear or overwhelming indication for total intravenous anaesthesia. The environmental implications of anaesthetic technique remain unclear and are complex, and it may not be as simple as volatile bad, propofol good. As ever, the best anaesthetic for your patient in terms of clinical outcomes is the one that will be delivered best in your hands, whether that be a regional, volatile or TIVA-based te TIVA technique. There remains a lack of evidence of superiority in terms of clinical outcomes for one technique, and an excellent volatile anaesthetic is likely to have better outcomes than an average TIVA anaesthetic. We await the results of RCTs comparing TIVA with volatile for general surgery and for oncological surgery with with interest and in particular for oncological surgery if these are positive this has the potential to be a complete game changer and I suspect we'll see the end of volatile anaesthetic use in the developed world over the next 10 years. Thank you very much for your time this morning and my summary is available on the blog site and I do hope you enjoy the remainder of your day. Many thanks.